Hey everyone, David Shapiro here with a video. So quick update, uh, I'm gonna try and start releasing on every Sunday, uh, followed by a live stream Q&A. They do that on the Y files and it's super lots of fun. Um, and I did a random uh, live stream Q&A uh, just the other night and I had a lot of fun, so like, why not? Okay, so anyways, today's video is Infinite Life, Biological Immortality by 2030. So for some background, um, uh, Ray Kurzweil uh, recently was quoted on Popular Mechanics as having said, we are on track to achieve biological mort immortality by 2030. So there's a few component contributing factors that lead to this uh, conclusion. So first, obviously, exponential rise of AI. We can solve problems. Science is happening faster, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get compounding returns. So some of those compounding returns are things like alpha-fold mRNA vaccines and so on. Combined with AI, uh, then the AI is being used to make better dyes for uh, machine learning models, so on and so forth. Then there's nanotech. Uh, so there was a recent thing on um, uh, out of Israel where uh, tiny you know, uh, nanoparticle-sized robots were able to track and capture individual cells. Uh, and then quantum computing. So those four things are all contributing to say, okay, we're on an exponential ramp up. Uh, lo uh, longevity, escape velocity probably has been achieved or will be very soon. And for those who don't know, longevity, escape velocity is the idea that uh, life extending uh, therapies are going faster than real time. So that means for every year that you age, you get more than a year back in terms of medical breakthroughs. So all this is to say is that we're heading for, towards an iPhone moment of uh, longevity medicine or regenerative medicine. And so what I mean by that is that uh, new technologies tend to combine in unexpected ways, which create, which unlock entirely new domains and, uh, and markets and so on. So in the case of the iPhone, it had to do with miniaturization, you know, miniaturization of touchscreens, miniaturizations of compute. Uh, advanced battery technology, and wireless internet. So those three things combined to create the possibility for the iPhone. And then once it exists, it's like, well, duh, of course that's the way to go. So when you look at the combination of AlphaFold, protein science, mRNA vaccines, DNA printers, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, material science, all of this is almost certainly to, to combine in unexpected ways and create entirely new possibilities. Neuralink might be like child's play compared to what's actually possible. Um, reality is often stranger than fiction. Uh, before we dive into the rest of the video, I just wanna take a quick break to say that uh, today's video is sponsored by all of you, my Patreon supporters. Um, and just this morning, well, by the time you're watching this, it'll be like yesterday or whenever. Um, <laughs> A morning in the past, uh, I added a, a Discord server uh, exclusive for my Patreon supporters, and it's already popping. There's already like 150 people uh, in it. Um, it is uh, really sharp people, which doesn't surprise me, um, but great conversations over there already. Any Patreon tier will get you access, um, but I do have some exclusive tiers uh, for higher, uh, higher tier Patreon supporters, just that way you get a little bit more kind of exclusive access and I know who to prioritize. Um, but yeah, so jump on in if you'd like, and with that back to the show. So for the sake of argument, let, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend any time unpacking the problems that need to be solved because there's millions of problems that need to be solved for, uh, biological immortality by 2030 or, indefinite lifespan, as um, people like Aubrey de Grey call it. But let's just assume that it happens. Let's assume that Ray's prediction is correct. Where do we go from here? So I want to unpack a few ideas. This is kind of how I prognosticate. So let's take a look at social reactions. So how is society going to react on an individual basis? Um, are people going to accept it or reject it? And if they do, what does that look like? Number two is let's look at the economic impact. Is this going to help equality or, or move us towards inequality? Number three is we're going to look at lifestyles. So, you know, the, I, I had this slide and someone asked on the live stream, are we just going to be hedonists if we live forever and we can abuse our bodies or are we going to do something else? So I have some ideas about that. Number four is um, innovation or stagnation. So this is at a species level. So one thing that people are afraid of, and they've explored this in fiction, is if we 
um, if we live forever, we might become very risk averse and we just kind of become decadent and, and self-indulgent and we kind of don't go anywhere. Um, again, I got some ideas and I'll let you know. Uh, five and six, basically, I'm going to do some forecasting to see what life is going to look like in 200 years and 2000 years. Obviously, most of my predictions, no, I want to say most, many of my predictions are hilariously wrong, but it's food for thought. So let's dive right in. So on the social reaction part, um, many people, I suspect that many people will reject immortality for spiritual, philosophical, and ethical reasons. Um, but also many people will embrace it. This is assuming that it's a choice. I, I suspect it will be a choice. I don't think anyone's going to be to have immortality inflicted on them or indefinite lifespan inflicted on them. That would be deeply unethical. Uh, but one of the key things is there's uh, many cultures and many people have a belief that death is what gives meaning to life. Um, my personal take is maybe this is just some self-soothing nonsense because we are trying to cope with the inevitability of death. But if you have a pill that you can take or an injection that you can get that says suddenly you don't have to worry about death, I think that a lot of people would take that because we're all a lot. I mean, pretty much everyone has a, a an intrinsic biological fear of death, uh, but it's inevitable. And that's kind of like a, a kind of a sick joke of evolution. Uh, those those biological entities that are most afraid of death and work hardest to avoid it are more likely to pass on their genes, but then they inevitably die anyways. So that's kind of, kind of, kind of not cool. Now, uh, I think it's going to split in basically two different directions. So I called the first direction, the mortalitasi, which I borrowed from, uh, from Dragon Age, actually, uh, basically people that are, that believe in death. Um, people that maybe not obsessed with death, but people that believe that mortality is good. And then on the other hand are the Methuselahs, the people that want to live forever. And that I borrowed from Altered Carbon. So I can't take any credit for those terms. I just said, oh, hey, here's a term. Um, so on the one hand, you know, when people might have made the argument, oh, well, we were, we're never meant to live this long anyways, but nobody's really saying like, well, let's bring back tuberculosis, right? So if you can cure aging, if you can cure heart disease, if you can cure cancer, if you if you look at these things as just diseases that are curable, then it's not a matter of immortality because you we can't force someone to live forever. You can still die from accidents, right? Uh, but you're not going to die from aging or age-related diseases. So that's kind of the, the dichotomy. So let's take a, a closer look at the social side. So on the reject side, on the on the on the mortalitasi side, uh, basically there's actually some really strong arguments to be made that aging and death are good, and this is from an evolutionary perspective. And I'm not going to read all of these to you, um, like one by one. But basically, whether you take it from a spiritual uh, perspective or a scientific perspective, there are some some compelling arguments to be made that maybe we are supposed to age and die uh, to give way to the younger generations and so on. And, you know, there's been bombings and riots over pro-life and, and pro-choice abortion rights here in America. Uh, you can imagine that there will probably be some, uh, some grumpiness over uh, the rise of, of biological immortality. Now, on the accept side, we also have some models from fiction, um, namely like the Baku from Star Trek Insurrection, which is a, a, a village of people that they settled on a planet that made them immortal and they basically formed an eco-village before eco-villages were cool. And then the Asari from Mass Effect. Now the Asari from Mass Effect are not immortal, but they live a long time. And so that's still a good exploration of, okay, well, if you start thinking in terms of centuries and millennia, how does your life change? So for those who accept biological immortality, I suspect that some people are going to slow down and some people are going to speed up. So on the slow down side, you might say that like you're going to spend more time mastering the arts and sciences. Um, you might settle into comfortable routines for centuries. Uh, on the speeding up side, you might uh, live hard, play hard, right? If you if you have regenerative medicine that allows you to do whatever you want, you might just wander the globe. Um, one of the biggest social changes, I think, though, will be reproduction and family structure. Because think of it this way. Most people, once they get to a certain age and they're empty nesters, they kind of get lonely and bored, right? You know, you, you, you get a, a single family home, a nuclear family home, and then your children grow up and they leave and then you have an empty house. Some couples are perfectly fine. They're like, oh, finally, the house is empty. Um, <laughs> peace and quiet. 
Uh, and some, some people will absolutely continue to live like that probably for centuries. Now, on the other hand, uh, many people, once they're empty nesters, once they realize, hey, you know, I've, I've had my children and I don't want to have any more. Some people, if, you've, if you're biologically 20 years old forever, you might have more children. I certainly expect some people are just going to be churning them out because uh, that just seems to be what they want to do. Um, but I think other people will basically just kind of all gravitate towards um, like retirement communities. But since we're all going to live forever, it's like retirement community. Okay, sure. So that's kind of the, the dichotomy there for the initial social reaction, you know, accept versus reject. Now on the economic side, you know, uh, the possibility of living forever uh, is, whoo, that's just super loaded. Because here's the, the big question is whether or not uh, longevity medicine is cheap and accessible. If longevity medicine is not cheap and accessible, if it's reserved for the wealthy and the elite, then we're going to end up with like God Emperor of all mankind level stuff. Um, I don't believe that's the direction that it's going to go, but I needed to address this because it is a very real possibility. This was explored in the show alter, uh, show and books, Altered Carbon, and that's where they got the term Methuselahs. So the meths or the Methuselahs are the wealthy elite who can afford all of the safeguards to ensure that they are immortal. Now in Altered Carbon, not only are they biologically immortal, but they have backups and clones that they can you know, transfer their consciousness into. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not above saying maybe that's possible because when I talk about those compounding returns, I don't know what's possible and I don't know what's impossible. So if we have the capacity to live forever, oh, and so really important side note, even if uh, life extending medicine is cheap and accessible for all, that doesn't guarantee that we don't end up in a dystopian hell because you might still end up with concentrations of wealth and power and nobody really wants to live in a dystopian hell forever. That's like the worst of both worlds. So let's not do that. Okay, so if we want to avoid that outcome and we want to move towards equality, uh, we ha basically you have to assume that some people are going to want to accumulate wealth and power. That's just human nature, right? That there, 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 there's a you, there's absolutely always utility in having more money, having more power, even above and beyond what you actually need. But the more money that you have, the more options you have, right? And humans need autonomy and self determination. Um, so that's just you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The more money you have, the higher up on that you can get quicker. So with that assumption, the question then becomes, how do the rest of us create and build and maintain a system that ensures that it's not too lopsided or that even if there are wealthy and powerful people, they can't harm the rest of us? So I'm not going to say like, you know, seize the means of production. However, when I was having the, the Q&A uh, the other night, um, people were talking about like using AI to manage resources, to manage companies and so on. And that's when a little like bell went off in my head and I was like, wait, that's what DAOs are for. So if you're not familiar with what a DAO is, it's a de de decentralized autonomous organization. So a DAO is, uses blockchain technology and they're pretty much perfect for AI to run things. Now, in the short term, I don't think that DAOs are going to run the whole world, but I think that we're going to start seeing experiments where DAOs run things like maybe homeowners associations and small companies and that sort of thing. And if the technology uh, is proven out, it could be that DAOs are the way that we uh, transition to a more algorithmic kind of technocracy, a good technocracy, where the AIs all debate and integrate our information and our needs and then figure out the best way to manage things. So that's one possibility. There's plenty of other possibilities. If you, uh, and I didn't come up with this idea, by the way. Um, the first place I saw that book was a, a, a pl that idea was a book called Liquid Rain, uh, R-E-I-G-N. Good, well-researched book. Um, the author isn't English though, or it, it doesn't speak English natively, so it needed a little bit more editing, but still a good, a good book. Now, on the other hand, if everyone is going to live forever and it's cheap, then we might very well slip towards eternal injustice, which, you know, we keep making grimdark movies and TV and books and video games about that. So that's something that we're all afraid of. So between corporate greed, oh, I said corporal greed, oops, typo, um, corporate greed and political cronyism, 
we it could end up with technocrats that control everything and then we get stuck in a dystopian death spiral that we can never get out of and it's a dysto- and it's a cyberpunk hell but nobody really wants that except for um, there's a few like really cynical people who probably genuinely want that but most of us don't want that um so even even so if you saw my video about the Moloch or watched Liv Bowery and um and Daniel uh, Schmachtenberger talking about these really mysterious forces at play that are going to push us towards that that attractor state anyways no matter what we do so we need to change the game um i have a whole other video about that so check out my Moloch video my in-game video if you want to know more about how to avoid that situation but i do need to point out that longevity medicine by no means will automatically prevent that and in fact it could push us towards that um so we need to be very careful now on the topic of hedonism versus asceticism um you know like what do we do right if you know that you can just take a pill you can abuse your body and if you party too hard you just sleep it off for a week and then you're back to normal like are people going to do that you know like i don't know about you but in my early 20s i was like yeah let's party um and if i had a 20 year old body again i'd probably do that again for a little while so th- this is this is an oversimplification but one one uh, spectrum to think about it is you can live hedonically or hedonistically or ascetically. And so let's talk about the hedonic life. This is the obvious kind of like, you know, just engage in wanton hedonism for however long you want because you know that you'll be fine. One thing that I worry about here is that if you are able to be saturated in joy and pleasure, you're going to become numb to dopamine and you're going to be like constantly seeking the next biggest thing. And so, you know, we have like digital minimalism and dopamine fasting and stuff. So I think that that could be like an antidote to the hedonic life. We might also come up with medicines that desensitize you or I guess maybe resensitize you to dopamine. Um, But if we have like entire swaths of the population who do nothing but mindlessly pursue joy and pleasure, like what's like, what's the point? Does that maybe make life meaningless? Um, And that'll be up to the individuals to discover. I'm not going to make any judgments one way or another, because even just pursuing experiences, you can make a philosophical argument that 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 is a good thing and that longevity medicine can empower us to have entirely new kinds of experiences. So one way or another, those experiences will probably be had. Now, on the other hand, there's the ascetic life. So ascetic life is about basically living more like a monk or uh, monastically where you deliberately deprive yourself of those joys and pleasures um, and focus on developing a sense of satisfaction from uh, and contentment through uh, connection, service, reflection, spiritual growth, and so on. And so what I want to say is that these are like extreme opposites. I don't think most people are going to go to either opposite. I think that most people are going to be balanced in there somewhere. And so for myself in particular, I usually like, you know, I try and have one or two like big social fun outings per week. And then the rest of the time I focus on research, uh, making YouTube videos, um, you know, supporting my Patreon uh, supporters and so on. And so, you know, I think it'll be just a matter of balance. Uh, So this is not nearly as big of a deal, I think, as the uh, the economic, you know, equality versus inequality. Now, taking a step back, though, forget the economics for a second. Let's look at ourselves as a species. Will we stagnate or will we innovate if we achieve uh, uh, biological immortality? So a quotation comes to mind, and this is just a truism that is said in, in the establishment, which is science advances one funeral at a time. So basically the idea is that... Uh, if, you know, if, if the status quo is maintained and the people that believe in the status quo live forever, they continue maintaining the status quo forever and nothing ever changes. So do people get stuck in their way? Um, if, if people continue to get stuck in their way with biological immortality, yeah, we could end up being a very stagnant species. Now, on the other hand, maybe biological immortality helps people stay more open-minded. Maybe we even develop therapies that keep you open-minded and prevent your mind from calcifying. Um, and then hopefully we can get the best of both worlds. And so what I mean by that is you're young, you're dynamic, you're, you, you're open-minded, but then you also get to accumulate centuries worth of wisdom. 
So let's take a deeper dive into that. So on the one hand, we could end up with mass paralysis. So imagine, just do a thought experiment with me for a second. Imagine that during the, um, during, uh, the, the height of the Spanish Empire, the, um, the conquistadors found the fountain of, of youth and they were able to convey uh, the magic of immortality to the king and queen of Spain who were deeply Catholic and then they were able to take that and then basically spread Spanish style Catholicism around the entire world 500 years ago. And then the entire world was frozen with that value system. So things like slavery, theocracy, patriarchy, and colonialism become the status quo forever. Or at least until something major happens. Because that doesn't preclude the possibility of civil war, uprising, and that sort of thing. But from a social perspective, many of those people that think that, hey, you know, colonialism and slavery was a good idea, might still be alive today. So what kind of values, like, need to be sunsetted with funerals. So that's something that's that's the downside. Now, I did think of an upside to this though. With the rate of change of society, it might actually be good to have some old guard people pushing the brakes more cuz I mean, the world is changing really fast right now and maybe it's even too fast. So, if there's a few people that are a little bit more resistant, that could be a good thing, especially with AI ramping up and, and who knows how fast life is going to change. I'm not saying that it totally counterbalances it. I'm just giving you some food for thought. Now, on the other hand, if all of our best minds uh, live forever, whether they're social thinkers or scientists or, or uh, spiritual leaders or whatever, if they all live forever, like that could actually be really good and, and that could actually support life and the world changing for the better faster. Because what if Nikola Tesla and Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking were all still alive and all collaborating to make nuclear fusion and warp drive, right? Like that would be pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, I'm not going to pick any particular spiritual leaders because all of them have their own issues. <laughs> Imagine that humans are complicated and the closer you look at them, they're all problematic. Um, but the point being is that having um, many leaders in the world that have centuries of wisdom accumulated could actually be a really good thing for us, could help st stabilize the entire planet um, and the entire species, which I think is on balance probably a good thing. So whether it's positive disruption or positive stabilization, I do think that overall, there are some, while there are some pros and cons, it's a double-edged sword, I think that uh, longevity would be a net positive for the species. Okay, so those are all the issues that I've unpacked. Now, let's dive into the last part of the video, which is my specific predictions. So in the near term, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I do believe that longevity medicine is gonna be dirt cheap and broadly accessible. I think it's gonna be cheap because at the, at the uh, fundamental level, mRNA vaccines, not that expensive. Nanoparticles, not that expensive, especially once you figure out how to scale them. Uh, and then finally, for accessibility, I think that government regulation will ensure that everything is accessible um, just because that'll be the will of the people, but also it makes economic sense to ensure that everyone has access to it. And the reason is because, well, death is expensive. Uh, the economic loss of expertise, but also end-of-life care is ludicrously expensive. And so just from a purely economic standpoint, it makes sense to push for longevity medicine to be cheap and accessible. Um, another thing is that it's going to be an array of therapies because there's tens of thousands of diseases and metabolic disorders and genetic flaws and every, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of things that can go wrong with the body. So when we say like, you know, biological immortality, it's not going to be one pill that you take. It's going to be uh, bespoke personalized medicine. It's going to be injections. It might be implants. It might be nanites. It's going to be a lot of stuff. Uh, number three is that detection, detection and imaging of biological problems needs a little bit more of advancement. Now, that being said, I'm not worried about it because I think AI is going to figure that out quick, fast, and in a hurry. So the combination of AI, uh, quantum computing, and material science means that you'll probably end up with a implant, like in your arm or whatever, that's just constantly reporting on the content of your blood. Um, there, there was a, some like speculative sci-fi kind of documentaries that I watched years ago that, um, that there, the sensors were actually in the toilets. So every time you go to the bathroom, it, it reads you know, what's coming out of your body and can use that to infer you know, your, your health. 
Um, I don't know, that's a little bit weird, but hey, it's one possible modality. Um, yeah, so the fourth one is just kind of a rehash of the different delivery mechanisms. Okay, so here's where it gets fun. Life in 200 years. I predict that due in part to uh, the technologies that lead to life extension, but also some of the knock-on effects of life extension mean that war, poverty, and disease will all have been solved. And so what I mean by that is that our best and brightest, whether they're engineers, spiritual leaders, political leaders, scientists, will all be living longer and will be able to help provide a steadying hand, not just for you know global harmony, but also to help solve the problems. Um, so that's going to be, I think, a really big thing. Um, and 200 years is, is going to be close. There's probably going to be some big like global conflicts between now and then. Um, hopefully just one more. Well, hopefully zero more, but in all likelihood, at least one more. Unfortunately. Um, number two is because of that aforementioned thing where like uh, most people are going to be empty nesters. And so we already have a model for that, right? Like you go to a retirement community, some of those people are the happiest people you've ever met. So I think everyone is going to move towards that sort of communal living. And I don't mean shared ownership. I don't mean like communism communal. I just mean like village living and group living. Um, in rural places, it'll be more like villages, uh, like eco-villages or that sort of thing. And in urban places, it'll be like high-density co-living situations. And of course, there will still be plenty of people who prefer to live alone or just with their partner or partners if they're non-monogamous. Overall, in 200 years, I think that the, po the global population will have stabilized. And I know that some people believe that the carrying capacity is like 50 billion or 50 trillion or whatever. Um, you don't want to live on a planet with 50 billion humans. I promise you, like, look into it. Um, so I think that the population will stabilize. It could, we could still end up with a lot more than we have today, maybe 15 billion or 20 billion. That would still be pretty crowded. Um, and then supply chains are going to be really, really blah. Anyways, point being, I think that uh, population will have stabilized within 200 years. And because of that, there will be very few children. There will be economic incentives against having children. So this was explored in an episode of Love, Death, and Robots, where you, in order to keep getting your life-extending medicine, you have to be sterilized. Um, that's a pretty draconian measure. Uh, so, but depending on the depending on what happens, that could become a thing. I kind of doubt it. I think that people will voluntarily just kind of get over themselves. Like everyone has one or two children, and then they're happy or whatever. But you never know, because, you know, grandparents get to the point where they haven't had children in a long time, and they're like, hey, I want grandchildren. And, you know, we are we are biologically wired to like having children around. Uh, some of us. <laughs> some people are like, no, get children away from me. Um, but, yeah, whoops, come back. Sorry. Um, yes, so I think that within 200 years, we're going to still have some, some holdouts of the mortalitasi. Um, some probably some small communities and shrinking communities that, that prefer the natural uh, flow of things. Hopefully they don't cause any trouble. I don't think that they're going to be like um, terrorists or anything because that kind of runs contrary, but you never know what's going to happen. Um, and also lastly, within 200 years, I think that governments and corporations will still exist as we know them today, nation states and that sort of thing. In the long run, though, I think that that idea that I that I was talking about with uh, you know decentralized autonomous organizations where everything is run by by hierarchies of AI with human input, I think that that's probably going to be like the long term end game. I hope if it's done right. And then finally, in two thousand years, because we're approaching the singularity, um, you know, heck, we might figure out faster than light travel before that two hundred years is up. Let's let's be honest. But what I'm going to say is that within 2,000 years, we will have figured it out. Um, if faster than light travel is possible, we will have figured that out basically in our lifetime because we're probably going to live a long time. And if not, then interstellar flight is going to be a thing. Now, what's going to happen as humans spread across the universe is that it takes an astronomical amount of energy to change the habitat of an entire planet, which if we solve fusion and have antimatter reactors and that sort of stuff, we will have enough energy to do that. But that being said, we might not, right? We might not have enough energy and material because if you run the numbers, it would take a tremendous amount of water and, and matter to make Mars habitable, habitable, for instance. And Earth-like worlds might be really, really far apart. Um, so like too far to get to. 
So it's easier to change ourselves. So this is, this is what I'm building up to. It's easier to change ourselves than an entire planet, especially if we have genetic medicine and cybernetic stuff and nanotech and blah, 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 all that fun stuff. So we might adapt ourselves to live on planets that we couldn't currently habitate, which means that we, we, that we as humans might deliberately speciate um, in order to... Um, in order to spread across the stars. And this is kind of in canon from the Star Trek universe where like they kind of have a really wimpy explanation in one episode in Generation, Next Generation, where like the reason that all aliens have roughly the same body plan is because we all had a, you know, the same progenitor species billions of years ago or whatever. So I don't know if that's going to happen, but this is just one possibility if you think of like, okay, we really want to get onto other planets, so what are the implications of that? We can either make the planets more Earth-like, or we can adapt ourselves, or maybe a little bit of, of both. But over a long enough period of time, we might consider like the people on Mars a different species, or in Alpha Centauri a different species, uh, which could result in like maybe they will actually look like Klingons one day. Who knows? All right, so I hope you had a lot of fun. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, um, like and subscribe, and hop on Patreon. Um, and also, if I got it working, we're actually about to jump right over to the live stream Q&A, so I will see you there.